Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well, um, that you're yeah, staying safe, not too stressed, that your classes are going okay. Um, I am uh, going to try something a little bit different today. Um, I'm going to do a kind of code-based lecture. Um, I looked over, I haven't yet given feedback, but I looked over all of the um, all of your homeworks for the um, school assignment. Uh, and to be honest, they were uh, pretty bad. Um, I, I can tell that folks are still struggling a lot. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I, I'd love to hear some of your feedback and thoughts about this. Um, I think part of the problem was uh, data camp, that I think it was, um, I guess, I, I still think it's a pretty good program, but I think it didn't force you to know what you're doing for sure. Um, so that you know you could get hints and things like that and I think folks did that um, and and uh, that it wasn't a great way of um, making sure that people understood concepts and then to go along with that like compounding the problem I think that I scared people away from getting help or expressing that they needed help um, well, yeah I guess I was using the microphone um, or expressing that they needed help from me uh, and so I, people didn't come into office hours, and I think that's because I said, you know, make sure you talk to someone else first. Don't ask me until you've talked to someone. And I think instead of uh, people read that as saying, I didn't want to help, and, you know, don't ask me if you have questions. And so I figured people were understanding things, and instead uh, folks were just uh, scared to talk to me about it. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I, I want to apologize for setting the wrong kind of tone and, um uh, and not recognizing earlier. Um, it's it's going to be harder now, obviously, that we're all remote, but I'm going to try. I, <clears throat> I, I was tempted, I actually was thinking about it last night and trying to figure out what to do and how to move forward. Um, and uh, I still think that we're close with the R stuff. I think that it's, it's tricky and hard, and I can tell a lot of you are struggling. Um, but I really think we can get there. I think that the you have now a pretty good foundational understanding of networks and how... Uh, how they work, and so um, I think I think we can get there. Um, I think we can get there, um, and so I'm going to keep pushing on it. Um, I want to focus more on that for at least the next week or probably two weeks. Um, probably end up moving our test back a little bit. I'm still trying to figure out um, our uh, what we're going to do as far as um, the exam and the final project. I want to figure out something that's going to work well. Uh, for a situation, I apologize that that I've been slow to uh, to figure that out. Um, but trying to, um, yeah, just trying to make it work. Um, so today, what I want to do is kind of step back, go to the basics of R and iGraph and uh, network objects in R, uh, and give a tutorial on that. Excuse me. Please um, come to office hours. Um, Talk to me, you know, set up other times. I'm going to try to be pretty available. I've been uh, pretty busy with a number of other projects lately. Hopefully, a number of those are kind of wrapping up in the near future. Um, so, but but I really want to try to make time and figure out how to make this work. Okay, so I'm going to I turn myself off, turn off the uh, video of myself, and go through the, the code and do this code tutorial. Um, so I'm going to start kind of at the beginning. I will make this uh, markdown file available to all of you. Um, I'm going to start at the very beginning. I know that a number of you uh, are just kind of installing R in our studio for the first time. Um, and there's still, I think, some issues around that even. And so we've talked about this a little bit, but this is an R markdown file. Um, and it is uh, composed of three different parts. The first is the title. This part actually gets created when you create a new one. And so if you do this and click R Markdown, it'll ask you for the title and the author and the output. And once you do that here, in fact, I'll show you. Once you do that, it will create that for you. Um, and also give you some examples. The second aspect is code. So this is um, delimited by these three um, <coughs> accent marks. Um, followed by R, which you know says that it's R code, uh, and then anything between that is interpreted as code. So these are code blocks, and then everything else is um, uh, text. 
So it's it's called Markdown. Uh, the number sign means that it's a header. I mean, you don't really need to know too much about it. And other than the headers, I mean, the, everything else is just normal text. So this is treated as normal text. Uh, further down, I have a bunch more. So this is kind of normal text, another header, and more normal text. And what these do is they let you create, you know, nice looking documents with code and text all interspersed. And so the way you do that is you knit it, it's called. So knitting an R Markdown file will create, will change it into a, in this case, HTML file that you can look at. In fact, I'm just going to use this and uh, review the concepts in this. Let me see if I can zoom in. We'll zoom in in this. I'm going to open it in the browser instead. Okay. I know that will let me zoom in. Okay, so uh, all my code is here, so I'm going to do it here uh, and talk about kind of some concepts. And so the the main there are a few concepts I want to go over. One is how to create things, get a network into iGraph. Um, and so the one nice way to think about it, and the, what I recommend, I guess, if you're going to be creating your own networks, is to uh, simply oops. Think about them as spreadsheets. Most of you, I assume, are fam more familiar with spreadsheets. Uh, I created two spreadsheets to kind of represent a network. Um, and this is what, and you could do this. You could literally do this to create a network in R um, if you, if this is an easier way for you to visualize what's going on. And it, and it very well may be. This could be a good way to do it. So I created two CSV files. So uh, this is, means comma separated value. You just need to make sure to save it after you create a, an Excel file as .csv. Um, and so there's two of them. Uh, one is about the edges and one is about the nodes. And so uh, that's what R expects and it's, it's a common way of um, storing data about a network. And so this is an edge list, uh, like we talked about edge lists. It has a from and a to, so those are the first two columns. And then the rest of the columns after that can be whatever you like. You could, any attributes of the edges. So uh, the, the, in this case, I included type, uh, friends or enemies, and the weight of the edges. So how strong the, the edge, the relationship is. Um, so that's edges. There's nowhere, I mean, there's nowhere within this kind of framework to store information about the node, right? So let's say we had something like age. Um, would that be the age of A or the age of B? Well, it would be the or the age of the edge, right? So this is only this is information about an edge. So if we want to store information about nodes. We need a new file. So this is that new file about nodes. And so I list each of the nodes that are included, and I include just some information about them. So in this case, age and what I'm calling behavior, which obviously could it could be represent anything. Um, you know, this maybe this is for you know based on the things we did recently, like drinking behavior or smoking behavior, like how. I, I answered a survey of how often you drink. So something like that. Um, so this is kind of the underlying data. And I think it may be helpful to look at it this way. This is information about edges, information about nodes. And then we load it into, oops, let's go back. Uh, we load it into R. Um, so this read.csv changes that edges into a data frame. So if you remember, a data frame is simply R's version of a spreadsheet. So it's stored as a data frame. In fact, let's do that. Let's go back to R. Um, we can look, where is, there is, where's my edges? There's edges. And I can look at it here, and you look, it looks just like the same thing that we just had. Uh, it looks like a spreadsheet. It's exactly the same. So uh, that's what we're doing first. Uh, and then we're doing the same thing with nodes. So now we have two data frames. One for the node attributes, one for the edges, but now they're in R. And then this graph from data frame creates a graph from the data frame. And it, the first thing it expects is edges. And the second thing is something is a uh, vertices. If you remember, they called nodes vert vertices. Um, something about the vertices, a data frame for the vertices. And so that's exactly what we've created. We give graph from data frame those two things, and it creates an iGraph object called G. And then we'll plot G. So this is what that um, graph looks like, the, those spreadsheets look like. Uh, and we can look so that the iGraph object, it's called, uh, stores the attributes of the edges and the vertices. 
Um, and you can look at those so you can access the vertices with this v, v of g. So the function is called v and we pass it g which is our our graph and then this just says give me everything about it. Um, it's kind of a, a weird syntax to be honest that they that they chose to, to do it that way. Um, but this is kind of how you access the data frame uh, that is about, uh, I mean, um, or the, yeah, that technically not a data frame, but that's not important. Uh, anyway, the, the spreadsheet about the, verti the vertices, about the nodes. Um, and so it has name and age and behavior. So it's exactly the same. And it's just stored with the, with the nodes. Uh, we can get the same information using this vertex attributes. And then the same for the edges. We can see that whole uh, matrix of, uh, you know, the spreadsheet of information about the edges uh, using this E of G. And now we actually get a little bit more information than we put in our spreadsheet. So this is the, um, uh, the tail is where it comes from and the head is where it's going to. And then each edge or each node also get, has an ID. So it's telling us what the ID is. So this is the name of the edge and the ID of the edge. So that's what's going on. Um, if, if we want to just see the attributes, this will tell us all the attributes of the edges. So those edge attributes. We can also change, uh, create or change attributes using R. And so this is how we access them. Uh, it's a, it is a little bit uh, confusing at first. Um, it takes some practice and some getting used to. I encourage you very strongly to play around with this. See if you can figure out how to do different things. But the main idea uh, is that this is called index, the indexer, these, these brackets. And we're gonna index the edges of G. So in this case, edges of G. You can think, I think of it as saying, take all the edges of G where, that's what the indexer does, where the edges of G type is equal to friendship. So take all the edges of G where the edges of type equal to friendship. That's what this part here does. And then get the color attribute. So something about those edges, where type equals friendship, get the color attribute and set it equal to green. So just for those edges where type equals friendship, color equals green. And then we do the same thing, get all the edges, but only where edge type equals enemy, set the color equal to tomato. Um, and then let's plot this. So now we have green edges. So these are the friendships and these are the enemy ships or the, the three tomato colored ones. Uh, so the, another, so that's, this is sort of the, the basic idea. You can do a very similar thing, which I don't show. Maybe that would be a good exercise for you. Um, I'll try to remember to put it in the document is to change the vertices and set the nodes. So this would be using V of G where V of G age or something. Uh, so change it by age or change it by, um, what else did we have? By behavior. Um, you could change the edge based on the weight of the edge, etc. And these you can use uh, less than, you can use greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, etc. for doing these comparisons, this indexing um, and selecting of which nodes or which edges you want to access. Okay, so that is that. Uh, another thing that we can do is get subcomponents of it. And so we may want to, for some reason, we think that uh, we don't want those that are over 21. We don't want to know about those um, edges. And so I'm creating a temporary graph that only has the nodes that are under 21 or 21 or under, sorry. Um, and so by to do that, I'm saying delete vertices. This is a, there's another one that's delete edges, which you would do in a similar way. Uh, from G, where, again, this is so, where the, the vertices, so it, it needs a list of vertices, so you tell it which graph to delete from, and then which vertices to delete. And so this is all the vertices where vertices age is greater than 21. Um, and so one, one way of thinking about what this is doing, we talked about this a long time ago, um, but if we look at that one, let's see if we can find it here. 
Um, if we were to look to figure out what this is doing, oops. Okay, there it is. Um, if we were creating this list of vertices, I'm going to just run it here. Uh, where age is greater than 21 and we're deleting them. And so what this is doing, if V of G, if we didn't index at all, it's all the vertices, all seven of them. And if we, then if we just do this part, V of G, where age is greater than 21, it's a list of true or false, whether something's true or false. And so when we do them together, this says, give me all the vertices where whatever is inside the brackets is true and it'll ignore the rest. And so that's why we just get C. So we take this uh, you know, list, this vector of true and false, and then this selector, this indexing, says just give me the ones where it's true. And so we just get C back, and then we delete C, and we save it in a new, uh, a new graph called temp graph. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing there. So those are kind of the big ideas behind iGraph, and some of the main things that you want to do as far as like giving color to things. Oh, the, the one other thing that's worth uh, mentioning is that you can also do colors within the plot itself. So there's two things, there's two ways that you can um, color a graph. And I, I probably should have put this into the, um, maybe I'll try and add a little bit about it now. Um, but there's two ways to color a graph. One is to actually create it. So this, we're making a color a variable, a color attribute on the edges. Another is to put just put it in the plot. And this actually will, would overwrite it temporarily just for the plot. So if we said edge.color equals um, blue, this will make all of the edges blue, even though uh, the edge colors are green technically. Or sorry, green and tomato. Uh, and are stored as that. It'll overwrite it just for the sake of the plot. Um, so you can do it that way, um, and that's what we've done before when we do something like, um, let's see, the edges also have a weight, so um, we could do something, we can also do it that way, so edge dot um, width, I think is what it's called, equals eg weight. Let's try that. Okay, good. So you can see that some of these are very small and the other ones and some are much uh, thicker because this is based on the weight. Uh, and so this, uh, these attributes, and again, that's temporary, but the other thing you could do is um, do it like this. Uh, you could say so there's some, these are, these are basically special uh, attributes that if the edges have an attribute called width, then plot will use that width. And so let's just call uh, width, uh, we'll set the edge width equal to the weight. And then when we plot it, we actually don't need this. It'll always be part of it. Uh, it'll always use that weight in all the plots that we do uh, because we've, uh, We've set it as an attribute. So those are the two ways to do it. You can either set the set the attributes in the plot, or set them on in the uh, attributes themselves. Uh, you can do the same thing with the the nodes. So that is, um, yeah, those are kind of some of the basic concepts of R. I encourage you to just take this code, play around with it, figure out what's going on, and come talk to me in office hours and uh, let me help you to figure out where you, uh, you know, if you're still struggling with it. Um, what, I, what I want you to do, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, as your assignment, but I, I want you to keep working on the Dutch school data um, for this week. So that's the, that's the, the goal and to, to figure out where you've gone wrong and keep working on it um, and, uh, and figure out how to kind of keep going along the, the problem that you were doing. Um, and so please, yeah, let me know where where this part is confusing. Maybe watch this video a few times um, and, and let me know either on Flipgrid, email, 
office hours, however you want, uh, where you're still struggling. Okay, uh, so I want to talk pretty quickly about the, the concepts from uh, this week. I try to write them up so that you could read this, um, but there's different ways that people think about how to identify groups in a network. Uh, the simplest is called is identifying components. So a component is just if you're connected but in any way to someone else, uh, if you could get to them through your edges, then you're part of the same component, if you aren't detached. Uh, and so it, this actually turns out to be not that useful because in almost all social networks, real world no networks, we end up with a single giant component, it's called. Um, and it's it's that seems strange. It seems like there would be people there would be people who would stay disconnected. Um, but it's actually, if you think about it, um, how it would work, uh, like it's actually pretty easy to see why it happens. So let's say you had two big components that were each like half of the network. Uh, and they're all connected to each other, but they aren't. No one's connected across the components. If mm -hmm. any one of those people gets connected to anyone from the other component, then they merge and they become a single component. Like it only takes one edge between all of these fifty people. You know, twenty-five on one side and twenty-five on the other. So there's twenty-five times twenty-five possible uh, edges that could exist, and none of them, all of them, have to be gone in order for it there to be. Uh, separate components. Okay, so you can see how this works. I created a few random graphs just to show. So this is a random graph with 3% density. And even here, it actually turns into, there's like a, one component and then a bunch of solitary. You know, I think these two are connected. These two are connected. You can't see it very well. Probably these three are connected. So th so that's the idea of a component. This is a component. You can see they're all, all these edges are connected. And then this is a component, this is a component, and technically every single solitary node that, that doesn't have any edges is also a component. Um, so only at low density do they really appear in real world social networks. So here, this is at 5% density already. Again, we have one giant component. Just because it's it's rare for there to be uh, someone that's, that's connected, you know, if all these guys are connected, when you're doing random connections, they're almost for sure gonna connect to somebody who's in this giant component. And then by the time we get to 10%, 20%, everyone is connected to everyone. So in in the end, it turns out components are not super helpful, except for identifying like isolates or maybe some small groups which haven't yet connected. So the next simplest idea is a, a clique or a click. Uh, I, I think I prefer saying click, but click is the other way to say it. Um, and these are groups of nodes where everyone is connected to everyone else in the group. Um, and so again, I created a random network. This is a small world network. That's what this uh, Watts Strogatz game. So there's a, a few of these that end in game and that just creates a random network um, with two dimensions and five a five by five lattice. So it'll be 25. This is it's confusing. You don't really need to know but that's what this is. Uh, and then we find the largest cliques. That, so this finds the largest ones uh, and I save that in a variable called largest clicks. And then we change, we give orange the color for all of the um, nodes in G, except in G, where the this is the first largest click. To get it, we use this. We index because it's number one. The largest click number one, if a vector is in this list of vectors, so there's a list of vectors, then we change the color to green. So that's how that works. So that's... Uh, Yeah, so that's um, and then we plot it. So so these this is the the largest. There are probably there are likely some others that also have are a click of size three, but eleven is connected to twenty four, and twenty four is connected to six, and twenty four like basically they're all three connected to each other. That's the big idea here, um, and that's the, there's no group where more than three are connected to each other. And this is this is a nice idea, but it's. Uh, but it misses lots of things that we would consider groups. You know, we wouldn't pick these three as being especially tightly connected. We'd probably, you know, say something like this is more of a group and this is a group, you know, that, that this is not, it's not an intuitive way of uh, identifying groups. And so the reading uh, talks about a few tweaks to this, such as in clicks, uh, where everyone has to be connected within distance of n. So you don't ha necessarily have to be connected to everyone, but you have to be connected at least within, usually it's a distance of 
uh, of two, so two edges or one edge away from you know your neighbors. Um, so that's uh, one approach. Uh, K plexes, where everyone has to be connected to all but K other members, which I actually find that one pretty intuitive. So uh, in a group of five, maybe you'd have, you you have to be connected to all. If K equals two, then K plexes are everywhere where you're connected to. Um, you know, everyone except for two or except for one other person. So it kind of allows for there to be, uh, you know, some noisiness in the data or things like that. Um, and so those produce, yeah, again, some pretty nice but simple ways of thinking about uh, communities and groups in a network. Um, and these are sort of like earlier approaches to it. The, the last one uh, from this, these earlier approaches is called K-Cores. Uh, and the idea of K cores is to identify central and peripheral parts of a network. Um, and so each node gets something called a coreness number. So it's really, uh, instead of identifying groups, it's identifying kind of the core groups. This, this could, there could be more than one core group, uh, but it's sort of who's in the core group and who's on the periphery and how much on the periphery are they. Um, and so uh, this code, coreness is the, the name of it. And what this gives you, in fact, uh, is a, a number of what the K core is. This is K cores. It's a kind of confusing uh, idea, but you can think of it as like how many. Uh, here, let's see what it is in this case. Um, oh yeah, graph corners. Let's just. Okay, so that's what I thought. It's ones, twos, and threes. So it's basically how many um, nodes are you connected to that are also connected to at least that many nodes. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It's technically about the, the subgraph that you exist in where all the nodes are connected to at least that many. But you know, number 12 is connected to only two other uh, nodes. Same with 13. Um, Whereas some of these others, so all of the other nodes are connected to at least, all these blue ones, they're connected to at least three nodes, which are also themselves connected to at least three nodes. You know, if you, if you made this subgraph, uh, there's a, it's possible to create a subgraph where everyone is connected by at least three nodes to each other. So that's the blue. Two is if there's a, a it's a subgraph, so a, which would look like this, where everyone is connected to at least two others in that subgraph. Uh, and num port number 19 is only a coordinates of one where uh, everyone is connected to at least one other in the subgraph. So everyone, uh, so yeah, so that's the idea of coordinates. And you can see it does really a pretty good job uh, of identifying kind of the, the cores. If we happen to have a few more edges, we, we'd probably have some four cores uh, and maybe a smaller core right here, right? There would there'd be people who are connected to at least four others who are all connected to each other. Um, this I found um, at, on a website that was pretty cool. Uh, if you remember before we've created a, um, like a, a um, vertex of like a list basically, you know, C here, let me, I'll show you back here. Uh, in the past, we've done something like this where colors equals C, red, green, blue. Uh, and then that actually should work because we only need three. Yeah, that should work. Um, and then the plot gets the colors, right? Oh, that's a new G because we, excuse me, that's our old G that we got from the uh, spreadsheet. Anyway, that doesn't matter. Uh, so that's what, that's what we want. So basically what we want when we're setting the colors, we want a, uh, here, let me show you what this looks like. So colors of graph cornice. Oh, let's just get a new, let's get, just get a new G. So that's the problem is I use G twice. So I use G here. I use, I use G a bunch of times actually. So this is the old G cause I haven't rerun this code. So I'm getting a new G. There's, this will be similar. This will be a new watt stroke has another small world network. So let's create that again. Uh, perfect. So that looks pretty similar. We have fewer two mode, two degree networks and, and more uh, one cornice uh, nodes, sorry. 
uh, fewer two degree nodes, two cornice nodes, and more one cornice nodes, and a bunch that are in this three core. Um, and so, but when we're setting colors, so what this does, it says vertex color, set it equal to this, uh, for each node, set it equal to whatever this kind of, ver this um, list is. Okay, and so so this is the list of colors. So it takes these colors, red, green, and blue, and then for each cornice number, so again, cornice of G is a number, so this will be the third, the third color, which is blue. Third color, third color, third color, third color, third color, until we get to this one, first color. So that's the first color, which is red. Third, 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 second, which is green. So, so what we want is we're passing this list of colors to vertex.color. It gives a list of colors, and then for each node, it gives that node the color that it's supposed to have. Okay. Um, so that is it for kind of these simple algorithms. There are some more complicated algorithms that are um, based on two, uh, like trying to cluster things into groups. Uh, they're based on two different things. The first is modularity, which is the idea of you're trying to identify uh, groups where the number of edges between them is greater than the number of edges, or the greater number of edges within them is high and the number of edges between them is low. Uh, and so this is one example of those. It's called a, f a fast greedy community detection. Um, and so when you plot this, so this is you create a community object. That's what happens here. Um, and then you pass that community object to plot. So iGraph knows how to, how to plot that. You pass it, and then you also pass the name of your network, and it creates this really cool graph. And so this one actually shows uh, modularity really nicely because all the black edges are those which are within a community and all of the uh, red edges are those which are between communities and so we want to minimize the red and maximize the black by how we draw these circles so there are four communities here um, and it yeah colors them nicely um, there's the other approach. Oh yeah, uh, you can also color it. This is kind of doing it manually. Um, you can color it uh, based on, so this is the uh, the colors, the same way we did up above. So based on this, this membership. So you can get membership from the community object. And this says which, uh, which group each node is in. And then we, and then we color it based on the, based on that group. Okay, so that is, uh, so this is the same thing, just visualized a different way. The other way of doing this is called random walk. And so what you do is you ran start at random places and then uh, move along the edges in random ways. And you do that over and over again. So you simulate just kind of walking through the network and figure out when do you, when do you end up in the same neighborhoods over and over. So it's kind of, uh, if, all the edges are connected closely, then you'll keep walking between those edges over and over, and they are in a, a group. So that's the idea be behind that. Uh, so it ends up looking quite similar often, uh, but this is the approach. And so the plot, you call the plot in the same way. This one's just called a, the cluster walk trap. Um, and so those are two approaches. There are a number that, you know, the kind of the big idea to get across is that it's not straightforward where groups exist. Um, it seems straightforward when we think about the networks that we are a part of. Um, it's often easy to think about how we would draw lines around them, or it seems like groups are distinct. But when we look at real world networks, it's actually quite difficult to figure out where one group ends and another begins. Um, and so there's a lots of different approaches that we can use to try to get at some of these ideas. Um, and so that is where we're at. What I want you to do for an assignment um, is number one, I go through this video, go through the beginning stuff, try to figure out what you're struggling with in R still, uh, in an iGraph, figure out what concepts are just not making sense to you, um, and let me know. Um, help me figure out where we need help still. I'll keep making these videos 
I, I want to help us get through this. I really have confidence that we can. Um, and the second thing is to keep working on your Dutch School Network visualization. I want you to try again, um, make it a little bit better, and also add some community detection. Just try one of these. Try to get one of these to work or a different one um, that's linked to on this page. Um, it shows a bunch of different uh, community detection. They all work about exactly the same. So these are all the, the cluster. They all start with cluster, um, different clustering algorithms. Uh, so try to get one of those to work on the Dutch School Network. Um, thanks, and I really hope I'm talking to some of you soon.